We're looking at how things are going to be developing here on Sky News throughout the day. Uh, Martha Gill and Kevin Schofield here. Yeah. So I'm having a slight brain freeze this morning. Um, we're going to be talking to you guys in just a moment. I just want to go straight to Westminster, though, and uh, get the latest from our political correspondent, Anushka Astana. On what has been an extraordinary uh, European election, it, it seems pretty rare, uh, Anushka, that we have such a big difference between the winners and losers, such a wide margin here. Well, it's one thing to say this is a protest vote, but UKIP topped the polls. This really was extraordinary. The earthquake that Nigel Farage promised. And what I found really amazing is how many people tell me they're voting UKIP from different political persuasions. One guy in Rotherham said he was a socialist, voting UKIP because Ed Miliband was too right-wing. Clearly, what we're seeing today is the Tories and Labour really waking up to this UKIP challenge. Already some talk from the Conservatives about manifesto ideas around immigration immigration, perhaps a wealth test to try and limit the number of people coming here. Labour think its rhetoric on the cost of living is what is wanted. And then there's the big Europe question. If this was a huge Eurosceptic vote, what does that mean if there's a referendum? Could Britain vote to leave the EU? Good, thank you. Well, let's talk through all this with Martha and with Kevin. And The Guardian this morning calling it a political earthquake. I mean, it's a sort of similar line across a lot of the papers this morning. How big of an earthquake is it? I think in terms of this election, it is a, it is a huge earthquake. It's difficult to, to see how it um, translates 12 months down the line in the general election. Um, I think it's a good night for the Conservatives, although they've come third, um, given, as I say, we're only a year out from the election. Uh, Labour should be making much more progress than they are. And um, these UKIP votes, clearly UKIP aren't going to get um, a third of the vote at the general election, it's, the question is now is where do those UKIP votes go next year and mm. that's, that's what's up for grabs. I think the thing about these elections were not so much the potential for victory but the potential for embarrassment. Um, Farage has avoided embarrassment and he's mm. established himself as the, and UKIP have established themselves as the fourth mainstream party. Um, everyone else, apart from the Conservatives slightly, have been, have been, um, have been embarrassed, uh, which is a problem for well, them. Well, are, are they in fact the third mainstream party, as Nigel Farage was saying this morning, and, and where does that leave Nick Clegg? Um, well, it's unquestionably bad news for Nick Clegg. There's talk about replacing him as leader, although I don't know how serious that'll actually be. Um, to be beaten by the Greens is um, quite something. Uh, yeah. yeah. And I mean, the question of the Lib Dems is where, where do they go from here? And where it, it's all very well saying, let's change leader. But would Vince Cable or Tim Farron do any better? Um, it's a, I mean, they're in a, I think they're in a bit of a, down, a death spiral, really. But what about those people who say, look, it's a clean slate, wipe, wipe the slate clean, start again? I think the they've been in power for four years now, though. It's, I think it's, it's a bit naive to think that voters will just completely forget about the previous four years of them being in, in power with the with the. Quite frankly, I don't know what I don't think it really matters whether they change it or not because I think that they're pretty doomed. And it's interesting what the implications are when we look at the Labour Party because lots of discussion still about Nick Clegg, but whether or not Ed Miliband will be reconsidering his position or whether members of his party will be urging him to do that. I mean, yeah, he's consistently pulling behind his party, which is a big problem because <laughs> when it comes to voting, voters look for an emotional connection with the leader rather than necessarily what the policies are. Um, and I think Ed Miliband thinks his strong point is policy, but in fact um, you see people losing faith in him. Um, but Labour do still have a strong brand. They're always going to be a proportion of the electorate who will always vote Labour. So it's a question of whether they can they can pull it up to 35%, which is what they need. I don't, well, think, I don't think there's any doubt they had a bad campaign. Ed Melbourne personally had a bad campaign. The picture of him trying mm. to wrestle with a bacon <laughs> sandwich, you know, just sort of seemed to exemplify how, how, how bad it was. Oh, well, we'll get more analysis on that throughout the day, of course. Let's see how things played out uh, across Europe. Our Europe correspondent, Rob Nisbet, is in Brussels this morning. Look, who's been uh, the big winner in this? Because it would seem that this shift to the right has happened right across the EU, Robert. 
Well, it does defy, I suppose, easy analysis. It's a complicated picture. Of course, national politics features in all 28 of these races. But there's no doubt about it that there has been an anti-EU vote on both the left and the right. So we've seen right-wing populist parties do very well in places like uh, France and Denmark. I mean, France is particularly surprising because Front National got a quarter of all their votes, which is the highest uh, that party has ever polled since its inception in 1972. But yeah, in Denmark, in Austria, we've seen right-wing anti-immigration mostly parties do extremely well. But if you look at the left as well, and in parties or in countries where austerity has been a difficult thing to live with for the past few years, you've seen the EU, which enforced that austerity, be punished uh, with EU critical parties on the left, like Syriza in Greece. And then there are the mavericks, the anti-establishment parties, you know, parties that have done well out of people who just look at this Brussels creation and this project and just say, it's not working for us, we're not benefiting from it, we don't want to have anything to do with it. Look at the massive support of the Five Star uh, movement in Italy, which is a party set up by a comedian, which is anti-politicians, anti-journalists, anti-just about everything. Uh, they again scored around a quarter of, of the vote uh, in Italy, just a little less than that. So it is an interesting picture. I think if I were to divide it up into three broad themes, it's anti-immigration, anti-austerity and anti anti-establishment. But we have to make it clear, the centrist parties are still in control. So this is not a roadblock to the workings of this parliament, but it is a bit of a speed bump. OK, Robert, thank you. Well, I mean, it's interesting, guys, how the, the independents uh, take on this. I mean, slightly different to Robert's in a sense, but, it, but he's right, isn't he? This isn't going to sort of completely destabilise the European Union, but it is going to provide quite a bit of a headache. Well, yeah, no, it, it, it presents us a pause for thought really for the for the mainstream parties it's a pretty damning verdict which uh, the voters have have given on how the mainstream parties have have run Europe have run the individual member states for the last few years as a result of the um, financial crisis and um, and yeah I mean it's going to be fascinating to see how it, how it all plays out I mean, the European Parliament representing 500 million people right across Europe and lots of people will now be looking to the Parliament where as we've been saying this morning a third of those people have been elected almost as a protest. But where does the power sit? Much of that power is still with the European Commission. So what does that mean for democracy in Europe? I mean, where to next? Well, yeah, I mean, that, that, is, that, that, is, the, that is the sort of $64,000 question, yeah. isn't it? And when you've got a, a party in Italy which has been set up by a comedian and is an anti-politics party, which has done so well, um, people, I think, are just searching for answers, and it's up now to the, to the politicians. Like it or not, we will always have politicians, yeah. and it's up to them now to provide the answers that, that, that people are looking for. I don't think that the uh, there is unquestionably um, anti-EU feeling, but it's part of an anti-everything mm. feeling, isn't it? Mm. Um, I don't think there's anything specific about Europe necessarily that they're protesting against, other than it's the biggest authority out there and everyone's anti-authority at the moment. It's a protest vote across Europe, just as much as it is in the UK. It's, um, do you know what, it's, it's enough to give everybody a headache. Maybe we all need to sit down and just quietly sit <laughs> in the corner with a good book. Um, <laughs> It's just <laughs> what book we can read, Martha, these days, or at least if you're a GCSE student. Yeah, so it appears Michael Gove really, really doesn't like Mice and, of Mice and Men. Um, he, I think there was a quote from him saying 90% of uh, school children have read Of Mice and Men, and that's a really disappointing statistic. <laughs> um, I have to say I agree with him. I, I found the book very, very boring, um, and I was made to read it. Um, and I think the fuss that is being made about these American novels being a bit, two American novels um, being taken out of the syllabus is the same fuss that would be made if two other books were taken out um, to make room for them. I think this is just part of um, uh, bashing Gove and I... I just, yeah, well, I have to say, I never enjoyed *Of Mice and Men*, so they, <laughs> I, I wouldn't be sorry to see it go. I know people have different views. Look, it's been really good to see you both this morning. Out of time, I'm afraid, but uh, you've got busy days ahead with all of this, you two. I've, uh, I have no doubt. Thanks very much indeed.